demand. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for the basic steps to starting a business webinar. My name is Christopher Garcia and I'm the business development specialist at the SBDC at UN and Valencia campus. We created this webinar off of a great document on our website called the basic steps to starting a business who would have thought right. My contact information is on the slide and a PDF of the slides will be emailed to you following this presentation. In fact, let me show you the what the email looks like. This is what it will look like when you get it. I will send it out right after. And in fact, just so I make sure everybody gets it, I'm gonna chat out this link that takes you to the web version of the email. So let me chat that to everyone. And you could follow along if you'd like, but it's all the, the content of the webinar uh, through links. And anything that I don't have in here, I'll send out through the chat. Before we begin, let's go over some webinar ground rules. Everyone on the call right now is muted, so don't worry about background noise. And there is a feature to raise your hand, and I'll use it throughout the webinar to make sure everything's flowing. In fact, everybody who could see and hear, see my slides and hear me, would you please raise your hand for me? Very good, very good, thank you. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and I'll answer the questions at the end of the presentation. And each slide is numbered, so include the slide number if you'd like me to revisit that slide. In fact, just to make sure everybody knows how to use the Q&A, would you uh, Q&A me a hi, hello, how are you? Hi, Catherine. Hi, Nita. Hello, Kozak. Hi, Kathleen. And hello again, Kelly. And Kelly is actually our, our new member to our team. She's the director in Silver City. I nice see you again, Kelly. Hello, Michael, and I'm doing very well. I hope everybody on the call is doing well also. And hello, Billy. Thank you, guys. I see two in the chat. You could chat also, but I prefer if you put it in the Q&A just so we have a record. But hello, Angel, and hello, Billy. And hello, Benny. I think we're good. I think everybody knows uh, how to use the raise your hand feature in the Q&A or the chat. Uh, if at any time during the presentation I'm going over the wrong slide, you can't see my slide or something's just going wrong, feel free to raise your hand and I'll, I'll be watching the, your hands throughout the presentation. That's the, that's the signal, you guys. Okay, here's a graphic of our center locations throughout New Mexico. And the mission of the SBDC is to build skilled entrepreneurs and strong businesses by offering no cost confidential business consulting and low or no cost training events like this one. I'm gonna tell you more about the SBDC in the next few slides. And if you notice at the bottom of the screen, you see powered by the SBA, that's the Small Business Administration. And the Small Business Administration funds us as well as the state of New Mexico. So those are our two stakeholders. This slide includes three topics for upcoming trainings. Uh, basic steps, of course, QuickBooks Online. We're gonna offer that one next month and then again later in the year. That one is already halfway full. So if you wanna take that one next month, be sure to uh, register as soon as possible. And we always offer a great cybersecurity course. And you know how to register since you registered for this webinar. And I look forward to seeing you at future events. Here is the agenda for today's training. I'm gonna tell you more about the SBDC, talk to you about our pre and post surveys for this training get into the basic steps and review and demonstrate our excellent resource research tools. And then I'll take questions. I'll also ask you to raise your hand during the presentation. In fact, I like to see where and what quadrant of New Mexico my attendees are from. So if you're from central New Mexico, the Albuquerque metro area, uh, would you raise your hand for me? Oh, 
Oh, okay, cool. Thank you, guys. Not that, not as many as usual from Central New Mexico. How about North uh, West New Mexico? So maybe Farmington area. Welcome, welcome, all the way from Farmington. Wow, thank you. Or the Farmington area. How about Northeast? So maybe Clayton, Tucumcari area. Okay. Oh, good. I have somebody from Northeast. That's very good. How about uh, Southeast? So maybe Hobbs, Lovington, Loving. Oh, perfect. Thank you, guys. How about uh, Southwest? So maybe Silver City, the Boot Hill area. Hillsboro, beautiful Hills, Hillsboro. Oh, good. I have most of New Mexico covered. I don't have anybody from the Southwest today, but I, most of New Mexico is covered. So welcome, guys. Thanks for attending all the way from wherever you're at. Now let's talk about the services of the SPDC. We offer two major services, confidential business counseling and lower no-cost business trainings. There are no limits to how much no-cost counseling you can receive. Uh, or training events you can attend. We have centers throughout New Mexico, so there'll be one close to you. And if you look at the graphic in the upper right-hand corner, it shows what we do. Renew, grow, launch, and start up small businesses. This slide shows what we expect from our clients. My fellow business advisors and center directors want you to succeed, so you'll be assigned homework or further research. So please do the work necessary to succeed. We can't make decisions for you or offer tax or legal advice. We could only connect you to the information you need to make an educated decision. And part of making educated decisions is working with licensed professionals like attorneys and accountants. Next, I wanna remind you about important surveys we send out as part of attending these trainings. Everyone who registered for this webinar received an email from Anonymous Beck saying, in anticipation of the upcoming basic steps to starting a business in New Mexico event you have registered for, we would like to collect some preliminary information from you. With this information in hand, we can tailor the course material to better fit your needs. Exact quote. So I just want to see by a show of hands, how many of you received the pre-webinar survey <clears throat> and hopefully did it? Oh, good, good. I have a lot of people receiving it and doing it. So if you haven't, please look in your spam or your junk folders. I'd appreciate if you do that uh, survey for us. It's part of our uh, requirements for funding from the SBA. And we do value your feedback and opinions. You'll also receive a post webinar survey. So please do that. I actually read them and I do value your feedback. Very good. Now let's talk about starting a business in New Mexico. Before going into business, there are some important things you must consider. Will I make enough money to live? Will this replace my current income? Do I need the benefits offered by my current employer? And this includes things like retirement plans, medical insurance, dental insurance, vision insurance, disability insurance, life insurance, and other important benefits. Can you replace these benefits by starting your business? You must also think about your educational background and skills. Do you have the correct educational background and skills to understand and operate the many facets of a business? And this includes bookkeeping, accounting, human resources, supply chain management, which I hate, sales, and that's just to name a few. If not, you may need to hire somebody to perform these tasks or obtain further training. And I have a great resource for you. It's called, it's a document called Test Your Potential as an Entrepreneur. I'm going to go to the uh, follow-up document that I'm going to send you, and I did chat this out uh, earlier, but I'm going to chat it out again in case some, anybody uh, joined us uh, a little bit later, and you could get to this document using that link. And let's open up the Test Your Potential as an Entrepreneur document and make it bigger so you could see it. And it's a great um, rating system for you to rate your skills and abilities to see where you might have gaps. We do offer uh, a 
wealth of trainings that might help you out. Or you may need to seek somebody to do these things for you and I could help you out or any other advisors could help you find somebody in that area like an attorney, an accountant, an insurance agent. It goes over the myths and misconceptions about starting a business. It talks about identifying startup ideas. It talks about feasibility analysis, which I enjoy. Estimating the cost of a startup. The monthly cost for your personal living expenses so you could get an idea of what you need to replace your uh, current income talks about business operating costs. And we have proprietary software to help you with this. So this is a great template you could write some stuff in, but we have uh, spreadsheets called South Dakota models and uh, they're great Excel spreadsheets that help us easily create a set of financial projections. And they're really, really easy to use and great. A recap of your costs. And then, of course, the article in which this webinar is based, the basic steps to starting a small business. And there's 13 of them. And on the back of that document is contact information for organizations you may need to contact when starting a business. And then it goes into a business plan outline, but I'll show you my preferred business plan outline. It's actually in that email that I sent out, and it's right here under SBDC at UNM Valencia Business Plan Template. So let's visit our slides again. And let's start with our steps. Now let's go through them one by one. These slides will be emailed to all attendees and that follow-up email will go to you. So don't worry about writing down web addresses. And step one is defining the business. This is the who, what, when, where, why, and how. And these questions are answered in a business plan. And if you need a business loan, you must provide a business plan to the lender along with at least a year of financial projections, usually two years of financial projections which is part of a business plan. Many centers use the fill in the blank template that I showed you just now. And uh, you'll get that in that, you could either go to the link for that follow-up email and I'll send it out after this presentation. Uh, there's online software such as Live Plan. It's offered by Palo Alto Software. You pay a subscription per month. I've used it before and it's pretty nice. Uh, but you, you, know, you have your free options. And the sba.gov, SBA has a great training with worksheets with uh, sample financial statements about how to start a business. And I'll show you those later on. And we more, have more tools available at nmsbdc.org. I also wanna point you towards the New Mexico Economic Development Department one-stop website for starting a business. And that's gonm.biz. And this webinar, uh, it was, a, or this, that website was a partnership between the agencies that you need to contact when starting a business and the economic development department, along with a push from uh, some of our legislators. Let me see if it opens from my slide, and it does today. So this is the official New Mexico Economic Development Department website. And the things I wanna go over with you from this website today are under business resources and EDD programs for business. And there's, there's actually a grant under, um, I think it's the Office of Science and Technology. Uh, there's actually a grant going on now until the end of the month for tech businesses. It's like, a, I think a $15,000, 10 to $15,000 grant. Uh, but what I wanna go over to with you today is under finance development, so the dollar sign. So the programs, I'm gonna give you a quick overview today. This, these would probably be the programs most applicable to small businesses. The first one's LIDA or the Local Economic Development Act. And what LIDA, the Local Economic Development Act does is it allows the state of New Mexico to put aside a pot of money. And they have, I think last time I checked it was somewhere around 20 million. And they could award this money to municipalities to reimburse a business for expenses in exchange for them locating in that area. And some of the qualifications are you have to be in a significant, you have to provide significant community impact and support, uh, preferably be in a rural and underserved area of New Mexico. The goal of this program is increase wages and job creation. So that's the goal to create jobs. You have to have a significant new capital investment in the area and have environmentally sustainable outcomes. What, let's see what a qualified entity is. It's an industry for the manufacturing, processing, or assembling of agricultural or manufactured products. A 
a commercial enterprise for storing, warehousing, distributing, or selling products of agriculture, mining, or having been manufactured, or an economic-based employer. And they define it as an employer who is deemed eligible for in-plant training assistance by Economic Development Department's Job Training Incentive Program. What an economic employer is, is it's a business that brings in most of their money from out of state. And that tip tends to be agricultural businesses, warehousing businesses, uh, manufacturing businesses and the like. But say you wanted to sell uh, retail things online, you have a huge warehouse in New Mexico, you're making most of your money from throughout the United States, that's an economic based employer. And remember, they say employer because it's based on job creation. <clears throat> Non-qualifying entities, it's usually service businesses and retail businesses. And to apply for this program, it's pretty easy. You have to be in, you, you have to have your business foundational documents already, but uh, you submit a proposal to um, the person in charge of this program is Mark Roper. And I've worked with the Economic Development Department and some clients for uh, LIDA and um, and job training incentive program money. And it's it's not very hard to work with them at all. It's really not. The next uh, program I wanna talk about is the collateral assistance program. This is a more general program. And what they, they do, the state of New Mexico does similar to what the Small Business Administration does, is if a small business owner wants a loan, maybe the loan's too large, they don't have enough collateral uh, for a banker or a traditional or a lender to accept that loan, they could apply for collateral assistance and the state of New Mexico will take out whatever financial instrument they do to help fill in that collateral gap. And it's really open to most uh, people, uh, most businesses, employees less than 750 employees. That's most small businesses in New Mexico. Is considered a small business by U.S. Small Business Administration standards. That's the pretty easy standards, and uh, has a NAICS code in the list. And if you need help with your NAICS code, email your local SBDC, and we can help you find a NAICS code that fits your business. And you could use these for startup costs. And most most of the time, when you take out a loan for working capital, you're getting maybe twenty thousand dollars cash to cover the expense of a, expenses as a business. Most lenders will want a hundred percent dollar for dollar collateral on things like working capital, marketing uh, uh, expenses, and things like that. So if that's a program that fits you, or if you're interested in getting a, a, a loan and you need some collateral assistance, that's a great program for you. And the last program I wanna talk about are Opportunity Zones, and these are actually federal programs. And the best way for me to talk about Opportunity Zones is to go to the Opportunity Zone map. And since I'm here in Valencia County, I'm partial to it, I'll go to the map of Valencia County. So what opportunity zones are, are there zones designated as low socioeconomic outcome, but high potential. And that this, these were designated by the census data some years back. So these zones might not be low income anymore. But if you want to buy property to start a business in one of these zones, you could apply for funding through what, an opportunity fund. And what an opportunity fund is, is it's a fund put together by um, use a CPA firms, investment firms, and they collect money from people who have capital gains tax that they owe the IRS. So if you sell a house, typically on the profit that you make from selling that house, you have to pay the IRS capital gains taxes. These people who uh, want to invest in an opportunity fund want to defer the payment of that capital gains tax. So if they invest in an opportunity fund, they uh, send the money that they would normally send to the IRS to the opportunity fund. And if they hold that investment uh, for a certain amount of time, they don't have to pay but for 10 years. If they hold it for 10 years, they don't have to pay that capital gains tax until they sell their investment in the opportunity fund. So it's a way for uh, the uh, um, smaller businesses to get private funding uh, in an easier way. And it's mostly for the purchase of uh, land and buildings. 
And if you see in Valencia County right here, there's a small patch next to Belen. You might remember there was a, a factory called Ketter. And they make plastic injection molding things. We might have a Ketter toolbox in our home right now. They uh, situated themselves in that opportunity zone. And in this larger opportunity zone in Valencia County, uh, the most, the largest business to uh, situate themselves there is the Facebook data center. So these larger companies are taking advantage of uh, opportunity zone funding, I'm sure. So why not a smaller business? If you, even if you wanted to start, say, a restaurant, uh, you needed to, uh, to get funding to buy a piece of land and, and construct a building. Um, you could do that through an opportunity fund. And what bothers me is they don't have a list, a very good listing of opportunity funds. So let me see if I could find one. I found one last time. Yeah, this is the one I found last time. I'm going to chat this over to everybody on the call right now. And if you're interested in, oppor in Opportunity Zone funding, um, they have investment focuses and then they have geographic area focus. We don't have many here that support just New Mexico like they would in a larger area like California, say. You could reach out to these opportunity funds directly. And if you have an investment focus, that might be a little bit better. So say you wanted to build affordable housing, you wanted to find investment for the uh, purchase of land and building. There's a lot more funds by, uh, by investment focus. And you contact them directly. You need to give them a pitch with the business plan and financial projections, and uh, they may be able to fund the project for you. Let's return to our slides. Step two is to choose a business name. There are legal considerations when choosing. Did I go over step one? Yes, I did, okay. Step two is to choose a business name. There are legal considerations when choosing a business name, and it's very important to find a name that resonates with your target market or markets, looks good on websites, social media, business cards, and other marketing material, is easy to spell and pronounce, and isn't trademarked or copywritten by another business. And I like to give this example. There was a restaurant in Albuquerque called Dee's Cheesecake Factory. And if you grew up in the Albuquerque area, it was one of your favorite places for lunch or a piece of cheesecake. The owners of Dee's Cheesecake Factory started this business after World War II and trademarked the name in the state of New Mexico. So fast forward to the year 2010-11, uh, there's a national chain called The Cheesecake Factory and they wanna open up a, a location at Coronado Mall and they since have, but they could not operate a business with Cheesecake Factory in the name because the savvy business owners at Dee's reserved the business name many years before. In this example, the small business had the upper hand, but you can imagine how a small business operating under a trademark business name could end up being sued, have to change their business name, and all that expensive marketing material, and it might actually destroy a new business. There are two types of trademarks. There's a state and a federal. The first website on the screen is for the United States Patent and Trademark Office. If you're going to do something like maybe have an online store, uh, you're going to, you want your business name to be protected across the United States, getting a federal uh, trademark would be what you want to do. If you are just going to do business, you're going to, I'm going to open up Chris's Barbershop in uh, New Mexico. I don't want anybody else to have a Chris's Barbershop. I could get a, a trademark through the state of New Mexico. You have to make your first dollar doing business under that name uh, before you could get a trademark. And there's tons of, um, great learning opportunities on, on the United States Patent and Trademark website. Since we can't provide legal advice, it's important for you to consult with an attorney before making decisions on a business name. And I'll show you some great resources later in the presentation, including one of the newest members of our SBDC team, the Technology Commercialization Accelerator at New Mexico Tech, staffed by Stephanie the Steffi Rawlings. Step three is choosing and registering your legal structure. The legal structure of your business is its foundation and you must carefully consider how you wish to legally operate your business. The common business structures are on the slide 
and everything but sole proprietors and partnerships must be registered with the New Mexico Secretary of State's office. And the paperwork is available. It's been solely online since the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. More information about legal structures can be found in the document called The Basics of Choosing a Business Entity on our website. And I included that link in our follow-up email. And I'll open it for us now. Basics of Choosing a Business Entity. And it was put together by an attorney. It talks about the law under which you're governed as a small business owner, and then goes into the um, an explanation about each of the business entities. And remember, sole proprietorships and partnerships don't have to be registered through Secretary of State's office. You just have to get your EIN number, CRS number, or gross receipts tax ID, and your local business license. But anything with corporation in the name has to be uh, registered through the Secretary of State's office. Let's go back to our slides. Okay, good. Okay, now that we're having fun talking about paperwork, let's talk about obtaining your federal employer identification number. This is the unique identification number issued to your business by the IRS and is used on all federal filings. If you're a sole proprietor, your social security number is commonly used instead of an EIN number. And this number is just as important as a social security number and should be protected as such. There's actually a statistic that says there's more fraud that happens with EIN numbers than with social security numbers, which is quite frightening. But no matter what business entity you choose, it's a good idea to obtain this number and it's required to open up a business bank account at most uh, banks and credit unions. It's free to apply for this number. You do it through the IRS website. I included a link in the follow-up email for the IRS self Small Business and Self-Employed Tax Center. They have a link to get your EIN number there. It's pretty easy. It's about a questionnaire. It goes through about 12 uh, slides and you get your EIN number immediately. Continuing with paperwork requirements, step five is to register with the New Mexico Taxation and Revenue Department to obtain a gross receipts tax ID. They used to call them CRS IDs. CRS stand, stood for re, uh, Combined Reporting System. Now they refer to this number as a business identification number or a BTIN, a business taxpayer identification number. So why in the heck do you need one? Well, it's the unique identifying number used by the New Mexico Taxation and Revenue Department to record and track your business's collection and payment of gross receipts tax. If gross receipts tax is a new term for you, you might recognize it as the tax you pay whenever you buy goods or services in New Mexico. It's usually around 8% and shows up at the bottom of a receipt. The online registration form is free to complete but you may wanna seek the advice of a CPA or a bookkeeper when completing the application, especially if you're not planning to track and file your gross receipts tax reports yourself. You must also file your gross receipts tax reports on a monthly, quarterly, or, or uh, bi-yearly schedule. And even if you have no gross receipts tax to report, you still have to file a gross receipts tax report on a regular schedule. Therefore, the department offers a great online trading and the link is on the slide, it's tap.state.nm.us. Oh no, that's the, that's the login to create a, a gross receipts tax ID or to file your reports. The no cost trainings is a link on the bottom of the slide. And let me show you using the follow-up email. It's under New Mexico Taxation and Revenue Workshops. And they have workshops for new businesses, new employers, and then they have a IRS web, a webinar on demand. I suggest you take all of them, especially if this is a new term for you, or if you're gonna collect it yourself and pay it, or you're gonna have a bookkeeper do it, no matter what you're gonna do, it's a good idea to get educated on the basics. Let's go back to our slides. Step six is to obtain your local business license and other applicable licenses. When doing business in New Mexico, you need a business license in the municipality or county where you have a physical presence. For instance, Teofilo's restaurant has a physical presence in Los Unas, so they get a village of Los Unas business license. 
If they had a food truck and did business in Belen and Los Unas, they'd have to get a full or temporary permit uh, in Belen. Some of you might be thinking that you're going to do business online or in another state. <clears throat> this means getting business, uh, getting a business license in any place where you will physically conduct commerce. Each municipality or county has different requirements for obtaining a business license, so check with the municipal or county office or consult an attorney for further advice. And for instance, Rio Communities asks you to sketch a floor plan of your business, no matter if it's a home-based business out of your garage. They still want a sketch. And uh, Socorro County doesn't have a formal business licensing process. They just have a letter on their website saying, you do not have to have a business license to operate a business in Socorro County. Please get your gross receipts tax ID before you start your business. An important item you must obtain before you apply for the business license is your gross receipts tax ID or your BTIN, whatever you wanna call it. Uh, and you can't get a business license without one. Step seven is to report new hires to the New Mexico directory. There's a link on the slide to the New Mexico directory but this brings human resources considerations into light. Human resources is a very important part of any business and comes with many legal and accounting considerations. You could always contact an accountant and or an attorney for specific information, but I included links to two good resources for learning more about employment procedures and laws. So the first one are, we have a, a, an America Small Business Development Center conference and Comply Right is a business that sponsors that conference. They do sell things, but they have a great knowledge center with tips, tip sheets, e-guides, um, and webinars. Right now, they just have webinars online. And uh, these web webinars give you insights into uh, the many different things associated with human resources. Termination tutorial. So this is a great place to start. You don't, again, you don't have to buy anything from them. Uh, they have a great knowledge center, but uh, you could buy some of their services from them if you wanted to. And then uh, one of my favorite resources is the EEOC, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. They have a website just for small business. They have a small business resource center. And if you are an employer and you discriminate against somebody based on the protected classes, uh, the EEOC will investigate, and uh, that's not a good thing. So before you become, especially if you're going to be an employer, take a look at the small business fact sheet or the small business requirements so you don't make uh, get yourself into any legal trouble down the line. Let's return to our slides. Keeping with the HR trend, step eight is if you have employees, you need to complete form ES802. And this is a required form for the New Mexico Department of Workforce Solutions or Connections. And the Department of Workforce Solutions has many services, tax credits, and learning opportunities for small business owners. So I included their business outreach website on the slide. Some common services of the Department of Workforce Solutions include job postings, that's their biggest one, pre-employment screenings like typing tests, and in some cases, they may provide space to conduct interviews. And let's go to their website. I'm so glad I'm on a roll. The links are all working from the slide. So what you need to know about unemployment insurance, workers comp, this is uh, gonna be in, in this area. What you need to know about starting a new business. If you wanna have, a, if you have an existing business and wanna post an internship opportunity, start an apprenticeship program, the information's there. There's also hiring incentives, and I looked at these, most of them are for uh, vet hiring veterans. And then there's, uh, they offer a bond. So say you wanna hire somebody with a felony conviction in their past, and it might be risky for you. Say uh, they have a, you wanna hire, you own an accounting office, you wanna hire a bookkeeper, they might have an embezzlement charge in their past, an incentive to hire them is the Department of Workforce Solutions will take uh, give you a bond, which is like an insurance policy if that person commits any wrongdoing. So take a look at this. Wage and hours, a wealth of information, and that's who you have to contact most pretty much as a business owner. 
and there's that link for form ES802, which is pretty dry and, and uh, just talks about you hiring employees. Step nine is if you have employees, seek the assistance of an accountant or a bookkeeper. You can all, you see all the tax acronyms on the slide, FUDA, SUDA, FIT, SID, I wanna sit down after hearing all those. And if you aren't willing or able to deal with them, please seek out the services of a bookkeeper or an accountant. The IRS website has a wealth of information about your federal tax obligations. They have a webinar, uh, I think I mentioned it earlier about um, small business and taxes. And if you look at the follow-up email, thanks for joining us. There's the IRS Self-Employed Individuals Tax Center. And on the slide is the, let's see if it works. If it doesn't work, I'll chat you over the, the direct link. Here's the, the link for the IRS Small Businesses and Small Business Tax Workshop. If you're not going to have employees, you could probably get away with taking the first four lessons. If you will have employees, take the whole workshop or webinar. It's, it's great information. And again, tax information related to the state, that's New Mexico Taxation and Revenue Department. Let's return to our slides. Step 10 is to seek the assistance of an attorney. And we talked about some important legal landmines earlier, and um, attorneys are licensed to answer any of those types of questions. Uh, and I have some great links for you here. So first is the New Mexico, uh, or the State Bar of New Mexico. And let's use our follow-up email for that link. It's sb.org, State Bar NM, sbnm.org, if I remember right. There it is, yeah, sbnm.org. And if you need an attorney, a lot of us don't know where to start, maybe the phone book, but the Bar Association has a, a listing. So I, under I Need a Lawyer, online bar directory, they used to have a referral service. I haven't seen it on their website, so I'm not gonna show you that. But say you need a lawyer, I only use in their database practice areas and practice counties. So practice areas, you might need a lawyer for business and corporations. They have, um, uh, let's see, intellectual property, uh, patent and entertainment, that's for uh, patents, trademarks, copyrights. Labor employment, so those are some of the more common uh, categories you might look for as a business owner. And then you could list them by county. I'm close to Bernalillo. We could actually look at Valencia. If you're in a smaller, more rural area of New Mexico, there aren't as there aren't going to be as many. So you might want to go to the next biggest county over. And here it gives us 56 matches in those areas, and we'll pick one at random. And this person has their picture in there. They it tell the, gives you information about what law firm they work for, and gives you contact information for this person. So this attorney practices in uh, aviation, civil litiga litigation, business and corporations, intellectual property, patent, entertainment, and personal injury. So that's a great resource for you um, when looking for an attorney. Let's go back, let me close some of these windows I have open. And let's go back to our slide. And then I put a link for the New Mexico State University Patent and Trademark Library. So the uh, New Mexico State University holds the grant for the Patent and Trademark Resource Center for the state. So David Irvin, that's David Irvin there. He is the Patent and Trademark Librarian for the state of New Mexico. And if you're wanting to explore uh, patents and trademarks, not he can't give you legal advice, but if you're wanting to explore uh, some of the databases used for patent and trademarks, he could really help you out with that. Um, that link is included in the follow-up email. And then of course we have uh, New Mexico Tech TCA, which is the Technology Commercialization Accelerator. And I, don't, I, I have this uh, contact information at the end of the slideshow, but I will chat out 
their new web address to everybody on the line right now. And what uh, the Technology Commercialization Accelerator does is they provide counseling uh, on intellectual property, which includes patents, trademarks, uh, copyrights. And uh, Stephanie the Rawlings has a wealth of, well, wealth of information and she knows how to use those databases very well. So take advantage of uh, her services. Okay. Step 11 is to review the guidelines for compliance with the Americans with Disability Act. This is a huge legal landmine for small businesses and should be carefully considered, especially if you're gonna have employees or you're gonna have a storefront where the public can enter. And there are people uh, who make their living suing small businesses based on ADA compliance. Uh, it's sad, but true. So before going into business, read the primer for small business, the ADA data primer for small business. It's the least you could do. You could get. You could hire a consultant. There are people who consult on ADA compliance, or you could hire an attorney. Um, but this is a free resource for you. It's right there in that link, and it's a wealth of information. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Step 11, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> We're almost there, everybody, with our, our steps. Step 12 is to establish a business bank account. It's a best practice to keep your personal and business finances separate, and this makes your bookkeeping process easier and will help if your business ever experiences a tax audit. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation has a great learning module for small business owners called FDIC Money Smart for Small Business. And I recommend everybody attending today's uh, training review at least the module called Banking Services Available to Small Businesses. Let me open this up from the slide. Oh, I'm on a roll today. Everything's opening up. Here's the direct link for the Money Smart for Small Business. It's everything I'm telling you today. I think it's 12 modules, 14 modules, and it's just elaborating on every one of these steps I'm talking about today. It's free, it's uh, taxpayer money. When we bailed out the banks in 2008, this was part of the uh, their repayment to us as taxpayers. So take advantage of it. They also have um, FDIC Money Smart for um, just Money Smart. They have Money Smart for kids, and they have money smart for teens, and they have money smart for older, uh, for the elderly. So if you're interested in any of those, there's the link for them. Uh, we paid for them with our tax dollars, so take advantage of them. And they're the probably the best curriculum uh, on this subject that I could, uh, I've seen. Other than this webinar, of course. Our final step, step 13, is have adequate business insurance coverage. This slide shows the common types of insurance coverage for small businesses, and I recommend you research your options with an independent insurance broker. Oftentimes, independent insurance brokers sell insurances from many different companies, and they tend to be less biased. Uh, and they're usually small business people, just like you, uh, just like everybody on the call today. You can learn more about business insurance by visiting the link on the slide. It's for the Hitchcock's Insurance Company's blog. Um, the Hitch Hitchcock's Insurance Company, they do sponsor the America's Small Business Development Center Conference. They're one of the oldest insurers in the nation. They've been around since the time of insuring Spanish galleons and whatnot. Um, but you don't have to buy anything from them. I want you to take it back to the, oh, and of course, my, my role has ended. That didn't want to open up from the slide, but we'll go to our our email here and the very last thing should be the Hitchcock's Insurance Learning Center. And they have, uh, you know, the top five reasons for business insurance. And then they have some videos. What is small business insurance? What is general liability insurance? And what is professional liability insurance? Get yourself educated on these because insurance uh, brokers could really take you to the hoop on, on uh, with, with, the, with these insurances. They could give you too much or they could give you too little. So it's best for you to um, research your options and get a little bit of advice from uh, 
Hitchcock's Learning Center. Now that we covered all 13 steps to starting a business, I want to share with you some research tools that we use to gain insight into industry analysis, market research, demographics, and traffic counts. These data tools are very, very important to the success of your business because they help you fill in your business plan, which is probably the best part of it, and make informed decisions and plan for the future. I want to remind you, your business is a big investment. So treat it as such. You wouldn't just uh, buy a stock by throwing a dart uh, at the newspaper stock stock page. So you don't want to do that with business either. So you, you really do have to get the information you need to make informed decisions. Uh, the first four I'm going to go over with you. I believe the, the first four are free. The first link is for a great uh, webinar uh, from the SBA's website on how to write a business plan. Let's see if my link works from the slide. Let me open up the follow-up email. And under SBA business plan lesson, actually this is a great article about planning your business by the SBA and they go over lean business plans and traditional business plans. But what I wanted to show you was their learning platform. And on their learning platform, they have two types of learning. They have the regular learning center and Ascent for women. If you're not a woman, take the Ascent for Women. It's a great program. But let's go to the regular learning center. And under plan, how to write a business plan, this is what I wanted to show you. And that link doesn't go there directly. So let me chat this out to everybody on the call today. And I took this as part of my professional development. There's 70 objectives. So it takes a little bit more than half an hour. Uh, it took me about mm, an hour and a half. But it was a great, uh, they're, they're all great lessons. And they're your tax dollars at work. So take advantage of those free uh, learning resources. Let's go back to our slides. The second link is for bplans.com by Palo Alto Software. And this website provides you with numerous business plan examples. Um, B, of course, Palo Alto Software makes that live plan software I talked about earlier. So they used to charge for a, uh, CD-ROM of all these business plans, and it was like 300 bucks. Now, since they offer that live plan soft software that you could purchase, they want all their business plans to be free. And if you need help, you know, inspiration for a business plan, want to see an example, it's a great free resource for you. The third is for Census Business Builder, and I'll demonstrate this database for you. It's a no-cost database that allows you to find demographic information about customers, census stats about businesses in your industry, and estimates of yearly household expenditures in certain categories. And the last thing is for the middle Rio Grande Council of Governments interactive traffic counts map, and it allows you to enter an address and see what the average weekday and average weekly traffic counts are for a stretch of road. Uh, for you in the Albuquerque metro area, I'll show it to you right now, in fact. There it is. Access the interactive map. So for everybody on the call today in the Albuquerque metro area, um, that's the that's the middle Rio Grande economic or the middle Rio Grande um, Council of Governments. If you're in another quadrant of New Mexico, you have a Council of Governments. They may not have an interactive map. Uh, but they'll have, they publish these in reports every year, and it's usually a year behind. So the information will be there. Let's do an example here. I don't know what 101 Main Street is, but let's see what the traffic count is there. So at 101 Main Street, that's north of Court, Courthouse Road and south of New Mexico 6, north of Courthouse, south of 6. So that's 314, I believe, right off of 314. We could see what the average weekday traffic count was in 2020. 
That's it was 9,259 cars past their day, and the average weekday traffic count in 2020 was 9,940 uh, uh, cars passing that intersection per day. So if I was, if, so if I'm a small business owner, I want to pick a location with high traffic. I'm a barber. I'm a retail establishment. Uh, this is a great uh, tool for me. I'm a food truck. Let's go back to our slides. Let me show you Census Business Builder. And again, Census Business Builder is free. The link's there in the follow-up email and on the slides. There's two editions. There's a small business edition and the regional analyst edition. If I'm in a metropolitan area, I could use the anal regional analyst edition. If I'm in the rest of the, the state, I'm going to use the small business edition, and I'll show you the small business edition now. This database is organized by NAICS code or NIAC code. If you don't know your NAICS code, please reach out to your local SBDC to find out what that is. If you're in a common NAICS code, um, you could use these quick search buttons. We'll use restaurants as an example. And then you could search by state, metro area, county, city or town, or zip code. Let's do 87002. It's Belen. And you could explore it on a map, but if you're in a rural area, there's only one zip code for Belen. It's not really worth my time to explore it on a map. I want to just look at the report, and I'm a more read it and learn type of person than a, a look at it on a map type of person. So here's the demographic characteristics it gives you. It gives you a total population, and these are all important things to consider when uh, starting a storefront or a business in a certain area. Tells you socioeconomic characteristics. And my rule of thumb for a starting retail or food establishment is to go into an area at or above the uh, national household income. Uh, Belen's catching up. If I'm a tradesperson on the call, this gives us housing characteristics. If I want to start an apartment complex, is it cheaper to buy a house or to rent a house? And it's in Belen, it's cheaper to uh, purchase a home than to rent. But in a lot of metropolitan areas, it's cheaper to rent than to buy a, a home. And my favorite part of this, again, rural areas don't have a lot of information about businesses like yours. If you're in a larger metropolitan area, you might get stats like uh, how much, what's the annual uh, income per employee and things like that. There's good information in there, but it's rarely available in our more rural areas. And my favorite part of this is the consumer spending. So these are annual household expenditures per year. So household per year in certain categories. And when I do my e-commerce, I use women's apparel as an example. Um, and you could start to explore areas if I was selling footwear, um, what zip code should I um, put my store in in Albuquerque? If I sold, uh, if I was a dinner restaurant, where should I, where are most of my target market in Alamogordo? Something like that. And you could use, and you could explore different zip codes, metro areas, things like that. It's uh, more, it's a lot more helpful when you have a, a metropolitan area and you have multiple zip codes, because then you could say, you could think, you know, where's a bigger expenditure on travel? Where's a bigger expenditure on hair care products? And the one that makes me laugh every single time is the dating services, because of all the, all the things they could put on this, they have dating services. 66 cents per household per year in, uh, Eight seven zero zero two, and then we have some paid databases. The SBDC pays to have access to IBIS World, Reference USA, and Demographics Now. Reference USA recently changed their name to um, a Data Excel. So if you want access to these databases, make an appointment with your local SBDC and we could uh, pull these reports for you. So let me show you IBIS World because it's my favorite and probably the most helpful to anybody on the call today. I have my access to the university.
that use the uh, single location full service restaurants in the US because there's a lot of information about restaurants because there are so many. So let me go over the high points of this report. It was prepared in September of 2021. And these reports are usually, they, they put a report out every six months to a year in certain industries. So before you go into business, my best advice is to get one of these reports from your local SBDC. So first, key external drivers. I also like to call these key economic drivers. So what drives the single location full service restaurant industry? Consumer spending, consumer confidence index, healthy eating index, households earning more than 100,000 per year, and an urban population. These tell you what, what kind of place would be best so high consumer spending, high consumer confidence, a probably low con healthy eating index, high concentration of households earning more than 100,000 per year, and a, a large urban population would be the ideal place for a single location full service restaurant. Then it tells you your second and first tier suppliers. And then it goes into your first and second tier if you have second tier buyers. And this uh, industry serves just the consumer not so much another business. This is the industry at a glance and it tells you which of your key external drivers are growing, declining or staying the same. It tells you what revenue, it goes out, it usually projects out five years. So between 2021 and 2026, revenue in the industry is expected to grow by 3.9%. It's looking good. Profit, it looks like it's a non-upward trend. Your profit margins 4%, which means about four cents out of every dollar will go into your business's profit. And they don't venture a, a guess for the five years, but it looks like it's on an upward trend. The number of businesses are projected to grow 2.3% between 2021 and 2026. Uh, same trend for employment and wages in the industry. That it gives you uh, the product and service segmentation, and this is across the United States. I can't drill down into Los Angeles, New Mexico or New Mexico, but uh, we could get a guide based on the United States. So what's the most popular type of food in the United States? That's U.S. restaurants, I'm guessing hamburgers there, followed by Asian restaurants. Yep, those probably are my two favorites. And let's look at the SWOT analysis. That's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It gives you those for this industry. It gives you a lot of narrative on this industry about what the trends are, what's coming up, what you should look for. Then it uh, compares the, the, the external drivers to revenue in that industry. And as you could see, as consumer spending goes down, so does revenue in that industry. And as consumer confidence goes down, so does spending in that industry. So uh, it tells you what it's really connected to tells you about IV and other establishments, gives you a lot of narrative on this industry, tells you where this industry is in the business life cycle. It's in the quality growth phase. So that tells me that's a great time to enter an industry when it's in the quality growth phase. If your industry is in the maturity phase, that means you're competing with businesses that have been around for eight years or longer. And if your business in, or your industry is in the decline, that means more businesses like that will close than open across the United States. Tells you the product and service segmentations again. And then one of my favorite parts of this is the major markets for this industry. And it looks like if I wanted to set myself up for success as a single location full service restaurant, I'd want to uh, situate myself in a place where there's a lot of households earning more than $100,000 per year or 100,000 or more. That's 50% of that market in the United States. Again, it gives you more narrative and uh, this report's vital to the success of your business. Get one of these reports. Now let me show you data Excel. Yeah, we have time. <clears throat> Which used to be called Reference USA. So what that could help you out with is, is it's like a phone book on steroids. So if I am a business who did business with other businesses, our star client not too long ago was Valencia Flour Mill. 
they make just to add water a sopapilla mix and they sell that to grocery store retail outlets and uh, uh, food service industries so restaurants So say I, I did what Valencia Flour Mill does. I sell a, fo a food product to restaurants. I could look for all the restaurants in a zip code. That are pr pr privately owned. Because it's probably easier for you to sell your product to a, a small business than it would be a large business. We only want one professional per. And fi there's 54 businesses like that in the 87111 zip code. Uh, so that's a great lead list. I could, and then when I go into these, like say I wanted to sell my product to Flying Star Cafe, I could go into this and I could start to see what they what next codes they do business in so full service and limited service restaurants. I could see how much their sales volume is, how many employees they have. And I could start to see the executive names. So maybe I call, may I speak with Mr. Tanner, please? Maybe I get a response much better. And then it gives you an idea of businesses like yours competitor report, which would be other businesses like this. So that's the business to business side. In your business plan, they're going to ask you who your competitors are. If you're going to start a restaurant, I could pull all the restaurants in your zip code and your um, city, ta town or city. So that's the business side of it. And then we have the consumer and lifestyle side of it. So most of you on the line are probably business to consumer type businesses. So let's do zip code. One per household, zip code is 87120. So that's Albuquerque, New Mexico. that's the west side of Albuquerque. And remember our estimated, um, our driver for restaurants was estimated home income of 100,000 or more. And maybe I'm just going to do a gourmet food restaurant. So maybe cooking and wine. Maybe I want to find those with an interest in gourmet food and wine. There are 1,662 households that match that, that criteria. Don't ask me how they come up with who, the who, what, when, where, and this, this database. The marketers just know what we like, I guess. Um, but it, if I was going to start a restaurant like that, maybe I want to, uh, send a postcard with a coupon to all these people or all these households. I could do that. If I wanted to call or email them, you'd have to purchase this database uh, from Data Excel. So the only thing you could do with the free ones that I could pull is to, um, to send them a, a letter or a postcard by mail. Another thing I could do with this is say I wanted to see what and let me go back, let me go, let me do New Mexico instead of a zip code. Say I'm, I wanted to start this gourmet food restaurant and I wanted to see where in New Mexico would be my best, uh, what county in New Mexico would be my best bet. So. Bernalillo County has 14,094 um, uh, households that match that criteria I entered in. Uh, let's see. Sandoval County has 3,530 households that match that. Santa Fe, 4,272. So those would probably be setting myself up, Eddie County and Doniana County. Setting myself up for success, those might be the places where I would want to um, put the single location full service restaurant. So that's just an example of how this could help you. Let me put you on mute. I'm going to.
Okay, I'm back. Let's return to our slideshow. And now that I went over the resource to research tools with you, let me take a look at the chat. Let's see. Okay, in the chat, I have a question here from Francis. Valencia business oppor opportunities and benefits. Do you have any opportunities on the border? Uh, I'm guessing you're talking about the opportunity zones that I share. Francis, give me a yes or no on that one if that, that's what you're talking about. But uh, let me tell you, so when these larger businesses station in a place, so say Facebook data center, they are employing upwards of two, 300 uh, uh, contractors just to build that data center. And they're going to have about two, 300 full-time employees. There are not very many restaurants down that stretch of uh, Highway 6 or Main Street. Uh, so that might be an opportunity for you to fund a uh, restaurant, uh, the purchase of a land and a building for a restaurant in that area. Uh, there's a lot more residents being housed there because there's a lot more communities being built in that area. There aren't a lot of retail establishments. There's Walmart. Uh, so those are some of the, the things that you might be missing. And we could do more research uh, based on the um, data Excel reports. We could see, you know, are, are there a high concentration of households with 100,000 plus? If there are, there aren't very many single location full service restaurants. Could you use an opportunity fund to finance the purchase of land in a building for a restaurant? So I hope that gave you some insight, Francis. Let's look at our Q&A. Okay, thank you for taking that survey. I appreciate it. Okay, Nita asks, I really want to start a small food stand or food truck at a local farmer's market. What do you think I need to get things rolling? It seems like it's so impossible. So, so I, I want, Nita, I recommend you take my um, selling without a store um, e-commerce and alternative selling methods class because I talk a little bit more about this. But what you need to get started is you need to do all the things we've talked about to start up a business. If you're going to start a corporation, register with the Secretary of State's office, get your EIN number, get your CRS number, and get your business license. And when you sell at a flea market or, or farms, then they often make you get a temporary or full license. After you do that, you have to find a stand uh, or a food cart or a food truck that's compliant with the New Mexico uh, Environment Department regulations for food service. And it's a little sticky. People think they could just sell food at a at a farmer's market, you know, bake bread, pies. It's not that simple. If you, you have to follow the guidelines from the New Mexico Environment Department, and typically you have to make your food in a commissary, which is a commercial kitchen. And Nita, if you're from central New Mexico, um, they have the South Valley Economic uh, Business Developer or whatever it's called, Economic Development Entity there. They run a, a service called the Mixing Bowl which they rent out commercial kitchen space to business owners so they could get their food product sold in places like a farmer's market. Uh, in places like Las Cruces, Las Cruces actually has uh, their own municipal laws allowing people to uh, sell bread. Oh, I bought the best brioche at the farmer's market in, uh, in uh, Las Cruces. Oh my gosh, I almost wanted to take a drive down there to get another loaf. But the, the elderly lady selling it, oh, uh, she just had to put a sticker on the uh, packaging saying that it was baked in a home kitchen. So it depends where you're located and and uh, what you might have to do for that, Nita. And I, I I do sympathize with you. It's not an easy process. Let's see. When starting a business, if I wanted to have a logo, where do I get that one designed? There's a lot of options for uh, uh, getting a logo designed. Let me show you. There's a website called Fiverr. And the like, there's also TaskRabbit and Upwork, Upwork C, they come up as an ad. Um, but if you typed in logo design, you could uh, pay these, these individuals to create a logo for you. That's not to say that logo is um, copywritten. So you could 
uh, consult with our technology commercialization accelerator in uh, at New Mexico Tech. You could explore different logo sheets uh, pro with that database. Uh, and you could see what's available to you and you could design a logo that way you could pay a professional to design a logo for you um, you could design your own logo i like to use a uh, program called canva and they also they actually have templates for logos and if uh i've i've helped people design logos pretty easily using one of these templates they're getting fancier as the years go on. You could use a places like Adobe Stock. And these are stock. Uh, they actually have um, templates that you could create a logo and then you could license that logo. Uh, you could pay to license that logo to use it on social media and whatnot. Basically, what they're charging you is to use the imagery that they have. So there's there's quite a few ways uh, to do that, Nina, and I hope I gave you some insights into that. And let's see, Kathleen says, would an RV park be considered affordable housing under the opportunity funds? That's a good question, Kathleen. Uh, a lot of people have wanted to start up an RV park on that side of Los Unas because there is a housing shortage in Los Unas due in part to the, all the contractors they hire to do work at Facebook. Um, and people are renting RVs and parking in uh, Albuquerque at the air, near the airport or in small RV parks throughout the county. Um, the zoning required for that, I believe is M3. And, and that's manufacturing zoning. That's most of the zoning in that opportunity zone. Um, so I'm I'm wanting to say yes to that, but I can't give you a definite let, yes, Kathleen. Uh, I think you'd have to discuss that with an opportunity fund. And uh, I'm thinking that looks very wealthy. Kathleen says, I live in Aztec. If there is an opportunity zone in Aztec, most likely that zoning is the manufacturing type zoning you need for a RV park, and the only way you could get the a definitive answer is to contact a uh, opportunity fund and seek out that answer. You could also contact the economic, the New Mexico Economic Development Department. LJ, let's see. LJ says, does it cost much when you want to register your company for trademark? So it depends what type of trademark you want. If you want a federal trademark. I believe it costs about $400 to submit the paperwork, but you might have to get insights from an attorney that could be pricey. If you want to get a trademark at the state level, you go through the Secretary of State's office and it's about $50, depending on how many uh, class codes you want to um, use for that. So stateside, pretty inexpensive. Federal side can be very expensive. Kathleen says, thank you, thank you. Brendan says, are there options or resources for somebody who can't afford an attorney? Not when it comes to business matters, trademark matters. Um, there aren't any resources that I've seen. Um, if you are talking about more um, criminal matters or uh, op uh, legal uh, assistance for the elderly, that's available. But I have not seen one uh, an option for or for business type uh, attorneys like uh, business and corporations, trademark, um, labor law, those attorneys tend to be pricey and they don't really work pro bono. Let's look in the chat. Candace says, I'm transferring business from another state. Any advice? Um, we do a lot of, I do have advice for you. It's going to be pretty straightforward with the paperwork requirements. Um, do research into the local and municipal requirements and where you're transferring that business. Uh, like if you didn't want a business license, you didn't want a lot of uh, regulation, go to Socorro County. If you have to go into a city or a metropolitan area, you might have um, more strict 
requirements for businesses. Like if I wanted to start a food truck in Albuquerque, there's a lot more requirements than if I wanted to start a food truck in, in Los Angeles. Also look into gross receipts tax. We're one of the only states that uh, collects gross receipts tax. That might be vastly different from where you're, you're operating now. Like Texas has sales tax. They don't really charge tax on a lot of services. We charge tax on services here. So that's uh, that's my best advice to you, Candace. Thomas says, please talk a little bit more about the TCA and help they uh, might afford to a tech startup. So they work with SBIR um, funding. So New Mexico Tech SBIR. So what SBIR is, is it's funds available to you for, as a small business owner for research and development. Uh, something, another uh, organization that has funds available is the um, uh, Nash, and, and National Science Foundation Seed Fund. And, and if you have a, an idea for as a startup small business in the technology sector, um, or you're a business in the technology sector that needs money for planning and development, or say you want to um, maybe go into one of these universities that has a place like the TCA, and they list the intellectual property the university owns, and you want to license that property for your tech business. Though those are the sort of things that um, these org that the TCA and organizations like them do. If you're in Albuquerque, the big the big one I'm going to promote UNM's. Uh, UNM's Rainforest and uh, CNM's Ingenuity. Those are some other great resources for you. Let's see, Francis says zoning areas for Valencia and Belen that can get business funding. That's going to be um, west of the intersection of I 25 and New Mexico 6. And then if you go up to Belen, Camino de Llano, West, Camino de Llano, and I-25 West. Uh, and in Rio communities, just past Rio communities, it's it's actually part of Belen, uh, where the Solo Cup factory used to be or where the Ketter factory used to be. There's a huge factory there uh, where opportunities, opportunity zones could be used for, uh, for building. And the zoning's there for that. And the, the typical terms you would use for that, the part of Los Lunas, that's the Huning Industrial Park and the Los Moros Industrial Park. Let's see, Luis, uh, Luis asks, where would you start if you wanted to tie a business into a local government like affordable housing, shelter, sober living facilities? I get a lot of questions about that. And those are very hard. Usually that's not a business. That's usually a nonprofit. And then you lose the ability to have ownership over something like that. Uh, if you were a business and you were, say you owned an apartment complex outright and you wanted to offer, you know, special rates for sober, a sober living facility, you could do that. But you really have to look into, do you want ownership in the business? How do you want to get funding for this business? And is it a business or a nonprofit? And then also wondering how you'd navigate the world of e-commerce businesses with platforms like TikTok. So think of social media as funnels to take people to a website or to lead people to call you. So the advert or the promotional efforts you do on TikTok um, get people to see you, and then you could lead them to your your Etsy store. Let's go into the Q and A. Well, thank you, thank you. How are small businesses considered for loans? Uh, if you are a business, uh, already operating a business, they would look at your cash flow, your income statement, and your balance sheet. If you are a startup business, they're going to look at your business plan and your financial projections to see and qualify you for an amount for a loan. LJS, which one is important, trademark or copyright when in terms of business? Business is trademark. Copyright is when you have something like uh, maybe you, a script, a book. Trademark is you could trademark a logo. 
a string of words, which is the business name, and then um, a, a catchphrase. Like I remember Burlington Coat Factory were more than just coats that could be trademark. Okay, I think I got all the Q&A for now. I have a few more sites. So that's why I like to do the Q&A after the, the, the database tool. So I have a little bit more time with you guys. Think of more questions. So since this is a COVID-19 uh, pot of money sponsored webinar, here is the most up-to-date information regarding COVID-19 for business owners, especially employers. If you look at the second to last, it's what you should know about COVID-19, the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act and other EEO laws, that's equal employment opportunity laws. Uh, if you're gonna be an employer, take a look at that article. It's probably the, the best thing you could do on this right now. And since we're getting uh, more, more restrictions imposed by the, uh, our local government about COVID-19 safe practices, there's the New Mexico Safe Certified Program. And that's a guided lesson on how you should operate during COVID-19 restrictions. And now that we talked about how we could help you, this is how you can help the SBDC. As part of offering our services, we need your help to ensure our services are around for many more years to come. So we ask that you participate in our surveys, report economic impacts because of our assistance to your um, business advisor or center director, and write letters of support to your local legislators about your experience with the SBDC. All information is kept confidential and we're really big about confidentiality in our organization and is only reported in aggregate to our funders and that's the state of New Mexico and the Small Business Administration. This slide provides contact information for SBDC programs, PTAC, IBA and the New Mexico Tech TCA. The Procurement Technical Assistance Center is a government funded program providing assistance to small businesses who wanna sell their goods or services to the government, educational institutions or tribal entities. The International Business Accelerator is a one-stop shop of resources for New Mexican businesses and individuals wishing to introduce their product or service into the global market. And the New Mexico Tech TCA offers no cost confidential counseling regarding intellectual property and those SBIR and NSF uh, funding opportunities. This slide continues the list of small business resource partners SCORE or the Service Corps of Retired Executives. West or the Women's Business Center Program, and VBOC or the Veterans Business Outreach Center. And here's contact information for your small business support team. We are funded by the SBA, the Small Business Administration, and many people ask about SBA loans. So I included a link to the resource guide. And if you download the resource guide, you go to page 22, 27. 27. Here are all here are all the lenders that participate in um, SBA loan programs. And the SBA doesn't lend directly, they lend through lenders, but they provide a loan guarantee, a lot like the collateral assistance program I mentioned uh, at the beginning of our presentation. And if you navigate to page 32 or 33, 33, these are the different types of uh, lending opportunities available to you from the uh, Small Business Administration. If you are a very small business or a startup, you're most likely seeking a micro loan under $50,000. They probably won't approve you for more than that if you, if you don't have a lot of collateral or a big investment. You will have to go to the participating micro lenders or the community advantage lender. These are probably the only uh, organizations that will fund a startup business. That's West, the Loan Fund, and DreamSpring. And I think this concludes our presentation. Okay, yes, this concludes our slideshow. Let me go back to Q&A because you have me for at least five more minutes. Okay. Let's open the chat. Let's see if there's anything in the chat. Francis says, is there government business funding for agriculture, farming, and livestock? There actually is. Value-added agriculture, that's through the USDA.
they also have loans, but I haven't successfully done a loan through the USDA. And they do have grants and, and lending opportunities available for you. Uh, the one that I was seeing last year or the year before was value added agriculture. So if you were gonna do an, a value added agricultural type business, that might be like uh, raising goats. Um, uh, no, let's do a better one. Um, uh, growing pecans, but your business didn't just wholesale the pecans, you made pecan pies or pecan candies too. That's the value added agriculture push that they're doing. So let me chat this to everybody, the link to the USDA programs for business, and you could uh, research those a little bit more. Luis says, this has been a wealth of knowledge. I cannot wait to dive into all these resources. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Let's go into the Q&A now. Tiffany says, are there any grants or government programs that will help develop a passive solar development, small subdivision? The lending opportunity for that would be the opportunity zone. And there would definitely be an opportunity uh, fund that would fund something like that if, if the numbers worked out. I'm not aware of any grants for passive solar development um, right now. There's grants for businesses to convert over to those sort of things. And those are, if you're a P&M customer, they'll actually um, pay half of the cost for you to, to make those kind of upgrades, but no grants directly to businesses for that, that I'm aware of, Tiffany. Marsha asked, hello, how do I open a nonprofit in New Mexico? Uh, this is already a 501c3 in Arizona, but wants to start in New Mexico. Okay, per, Marsha, I get this question a lot, and I'm glad you asked. It. We we can't really counsel on non for nonprofits, but I'm going to give you the best resource I'm able to in New Mexico. That's the Center for Nonprofit Excellence, and they are uh, funded by the United Way, and they actually changed their website to groundworksnm.org. And I'm gonna chat this over to everybody on the call right now. The website. And I'm gonna show you they have under learn. I wanna say it's toolkits. They have a wealth of information. They used to have a particular document, Marsha, that went through, I think it was like the 10 or 11 steps to start a nonprofit. And I'm sure that's available somewhere on this website. They just changed the website on me. They, it used to be the Center for Nonprofit Excellence.org and now it's Groundworks New Mexico. But that would be my best uh, uh, recommendation to you. Well, thank you for all. Uh, thank you for spending time with me today, everybody. We're at about the time. Um, if you need any follow up from me, you have my uh, uh, email address. We, I want to use this webinar as a door, as an open door for you to come in and consult with your local SPDC, because we have people with expertise in a lot of different things, and uh, we're a no cost service provided to you by the state of New Mexico and the Small Business Administration. So have a good afternoon. I'm going to end the webinar for all.